Hi, and welcome back to another Tech Minds video. Now, when it comes to amplifying your ham radio transmission from your low power transceiver, an amplifier will be needed. With many cheap solutions on the market these days, it's hard to know beforehand if that cheap amplifier will keep you legal when you're using it, or if it's going to last without popping up in smoke upon your first transmission. Now for a while, the Hard Rock 50 HF power amplifier from Hobby PCB has been an extremely popular 50 watt HF amplifier within the ham radio community. Why? Well, because of its build quality, features, and most importantly, the use of proper filters for each frequency it's designed to use. Now covering from 160 meters up to six meters, the Hard Rock 50 also has an interface support for many types of radios like Elecraft, Yaesu, and Zygu. Fully controllable via a rear serial interface and USB interface, it's also a popular choice for the Hermes Light 2, which we all know is a superb 5 watt SDR transceiver available from makerfabs.com. Now when ordering the Hard Rock 50, you'll receive it as a kit. Now all the hard surface mount components are already fitted to the board, but there's still some level of building required to get it up to a stage where you can use it. Now it's been designed in such a way that even the newest comers to the hobby can assemble it simply by following the well-written assembly manual available on the Hobby PCB website. Now in this video, I'll go through each step of building the Hard Rock 50 as it comes delivered. You can also follow along by downloading the manual from the Hobby PCB website. Now the manual details all the parts that you should have in the box, so it might be worth just going through the parts list and what's in the box to make sure that you have everything there. Now the first step is to find the front panel PCB and solder a 1x16 header onto that PCB. Just make sure to install it the correct way around as shown in the manual, as this is where the LCD will be soldered to. Once the header has been installed, you can now attach the LCD using the spacers, nuts and bolts as detailed in the manual. But at this stage, don't solder the LCD in just yet as we need to align it to the front panel. Push the LED in its place on the PCB, ensuring that you have the correct orientation. You can now attach the PCB with LCD to the front panel, but do this loosely as it will need to move around to align the screen and buttons within those panel holes. Once it's in the right position, just tighten the nuts on the back of the front panel LCD and then just remove the front panel. You can now go ahead and solder the LCD into place by soldering all of those 16 pins. Now fit the PCB back to the front panel and this time carefully push the LED up so it just pokes out of that intended hole on the front panel. When it's in place, you can solder the LED legs on the PCB. Just don't forget to trim those extra wires that are poking out. Now next we need to assemble the rear panel. Place the DB9 connector on the board, but at this stage don't solder it just yet. You need to fit the spaces that go between the DB9 and the main board, and then bring the rear plate over it. Now this can be a little bit fiddly to do, but you'll get there in the end. Now once the rear board is attached to the back panel, make sure to align all of the sockets by moving the board around. Once aligned, you can now tighten all those bolts up to make it secure. Now at this point, you can go ahead and solder the rest of the pins on that DB9. The next part of the manual details how to wind all of these inductors and transformers. Now this will take a little time, but this is what you're looking to achieve. Each toroid has a photo in the manual of how it should look like. So just make sure to check that as well. Now, once you have all the inductors and transformers wound correctly, it's now time to move onto the main board. So take it out of its packaging and give it a visual inspection just to make sure nothing looks damaged. Now it should be perfect as Hobby PCB do package these extremely well. The first thing we need to do is install a little jumper onto the board and this can go in one of two places, depending on whether you have the QSK kit. I didn't have the kit, so I just installed it as stated in the manual. And I just used a piece of the LED leg that I cut off earlier, as this makes a nice contact and is easy to bend into shape. 
Now, in the hardware package, you'll find four spaces, and these need to be soldered to the underside of the main board. Just use some of the included nuts and bolts to hold them in place while soldering. Now, try and keep them central to the hole when it comes to soldering them. Also, they become very hot. So as you move from one to the other, just make sure not to touch the ones that are already soldered, otherwise you might get a little burn. Now once they're all soldered, you can remove the nuts and bolts, as we will use them later in the build, but for now, we don't need them. Perform a visual inspection to make sure all of those soldered spaces are flat to the PCB and central to the hole. Hopefully by using the nuts and bolts to secure them, they should all be soldered in the perfect location. Now most of the relays are already installed on the board, that's those orange rectangle things, but there is one white relay that we need to solder. Now there are only eight pins, but just be careful not to bend the pins as you insert it into the PCB. Now once they're all inserted correctly and the relay is flush with the PCB, you can solder each of those pins. So once that's done, now it's time to install the transformers and the inductors that you made earlier. Now the manual states which position to attach all of these to, and the PCB is silk screened to identify each location. Winding the toroids and fitting them may seem a bit daunting at first, but it's actually quite enjoyable. When it comes to installing, just make sure that none of them touch each other. You can slightly move each toroid's position once they're soldered in, as the enamel copper wire is very rigid. And when it comes to tinning or stripping the enamel from the toroid wires, I just used a really hot soldering iron with a blob of solder on it, then slowly moved the iron up and down until the enamel burnt away and the solder started to adhere to that copper. Now you can use a sharp knife to remove some of the enamel before using the soldering iron if you like, but always make sure that each lead of the toroid is fully tinned with shiny solder before inserting it into that PCB and soldering it into place. So now the toroids are installed, we can now start thinking about mounting the main PCB onto the heatsink and then attaching the front panel. There are a few steps to this, so make sure to follow each one correctly according to the manual. Now first we need to cut some of the included coax to length and prepare the ends. Follow the manual for the exact locations as to where they're soldered and which connection block to connect the other end to. Next, temporarily attach the main PCB to the heatsink, but make sure to insert the four MOSFETs into location, but do not solder them just yet. You can also insert the temperature sensor into the main PCB, but again, don't solder that just yet. Now place the right angle connector into the main board and then temporarily attach the front panel. Once everything fills in place, you can apply a small bit of solder to one of the pins of the right angle connector just to keep it in place when you remove it. You can also solder the temperature sensor at this point. The MOSFET should be totally flat against the heatsink with the screws tightened up. Now you can look between the heatsink and the main PCB to ensure that they're in the correct location. If they are, just solder the center pin of each of the MOSFETs and then remove the front panel and main board. You can now go ahead and solder the right angle front panel connector, but be careful there's, there's quite a lot of pins and they're quite close together, so make sure each solder joint does not overflow to another one. You can also solder the remaining pins of the MOSFETs. Now each of the MOSFETs and the temperature sensor requires a little thermal compound to be applied to the heatsink side. Now this will help with heat transfer from the component to the heatsink when in use. The supplied compound can be a little watery at first, so before opening the packet, just squish it around a bit to make sure that it's mixed very well with inside the package. And once mixed and applied, you can now attach the main board to the heatsink. You can also fit the screws which hold each MOSFET flat to the heatsink. Just don't tighten everything up until you've attached the front panel, which is what you can do now. Now once the front panel has been attached, you can now tighten all the screws up to secure everything into place. So now we need to attach the front panel power switch and then solder the supplied cable. For me, it was slightly too long, so I trimmed the wires to the desired length, tinned them and then soldered onto the power switch. Now just be careful when soldering onto that power switch as it's made of plastic and too much heat could melt it. 
so be extremely quick when you're soldering these wires onto that switch. Now it's time to finish up that rear panel by attaching the SO239 sockets. When attaching, don't forget to also attach that little earth lug as this is where the outer braid of the coax will solder to. You can now go ahead and loosely fit that rear panel. With everything attached and aligned, you now need to cut two short pieces of coax which will be soldered to the SO329 sockets and then the other end attaches to the main board. The lengths of these can be found in the user's manual. Just ensure to tend the inner and outer core before trying to solder these to the connector as it makes life so much easier and it's best practice. Now once soldered onto the SO239 sockets, we can now attach them to the main PCB. The main PCB has a little connector block with screws on to hold the wires in place. Just ensure to insert the outer braid to the connector side labeled as ground or GND. With everything connected and installed, it's now time to perform some electrical tests. Now this involves measuring the gate resistance of each of the MOSFETs and also measuring the resistance via the power connector with the power switched on or off. Now I'm not going to cover exactly what to do here because we never know if these values may change in the future release kits of this product. So it's best to look in the latest manual available for these values and the setup procedure. With those checks done, now it's time for me to apply power for the first time and with my fingers and toes crossed, luckily it appears to be working as the screen is lit up and it's showing some text. One of the last steps of the electrical setup is to set the DC bias for each of those MOSFETs. Now this is quite easy to do, but you will need a way of measuring the current that's being drawn by the amplifier from your power supply. You can either use a multimeter, which has a one milliamp resolution for measuring current, or if you have a variable voltage and variable current power supply like I have here, you can use that to view the current drain. The setup procedure for the BIOS is simply starting at VR1 and adjusting for 150 milliamp. Then adjust VR2 so the drain is 300 milliamp, then VR3 so the drain is 450 milliamp, and then VR4 which is 600 milliamp. Now with my power supply, I can limit the current, which is great for projects like this, because if I'd made a mistake in the build, then the power supply will trip out and cut off its supply if it draws too much current. So we know that with the amplifier PTT keyed, but with no RF input, the max current draw should be around 600 milliamp. So I just set my power supply to trip at say 620 milliamp meaning my amp is protected in case of an issue while setting up. For the exact electrical setup, just consult the manual. And as mentioned before, you can download the latest version from the Hobby PCB website. So now I'm ready to test it on air to see how well it works. This is uh, M0 DQW. M0 DQW testing. This is uh, M0 DQW testing, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, M0 DQW testing, one, two, three, four, five. Now, if you want more information about how this amplifier actually works on air, even a run through of the menu system and its features and functions, then check out one of my previous videos where I've done a complete review of the Hard Rock 50 went through the menu, went through the functions, connected it to my Hermes Light 2, and then had a QSO on air. Anyway guys, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this build video. And if you got one of these, let me know down in the comments below. Let me know what you think about it. On the comments on my last video, it appears that anyone who's got one of these has nothing but positive things to say about it. Anyway, to the next video. Take care, stay safe, thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video.